then sir your host now sir okay thank you hello everyone good morning good evening good evening i guess i'm just waiting for rupesh to kick off the recording as we get started here <laughs> So it's uh, recording, sir. Oh, okay. All right, good. All right, let's get started here. Um, before we get started with the new session or, or the enterprise architecture overview session today, I want to take a quick pause and uh, give students an opportunity to ask any questions from our previous session. Anyone have any questions from our uh, previous session? Student, you can unmute yourselves. If you're having any doubts regarding previous uh, session, healthcare with uh, AI and machine learning. If you're having any queries, you can uh, ask, sir. All right. Um. Another 30 seconds and then we get started here. I don't, I don't see any raised hands or unmuted lines here, which tells me that you are pretty comfortable. Even, even if you're not, no problem. Send me a question on the uh, WhatsApp group. Or if you have a LinkedIn profile, feel free to connect and you can send a question or a query or uh, communicate with me on LinkedIn as well. All right, let's get started here. <clears throat> so since there are a few students who are new to today's session, let me go ahead and introduce myself quickly. Um, my name is Jay Kishore Sanakula. I work for NetApp and Compliance used to be called. It's a hybrid um, cloud data management services. I work as a healthcare um, applications architect or healthcare solutions architect, depending upon who you're talking with. I'm based out of uh, Cary, North Carolina. I'm originally from Tirupati. Uh, here's a brief overview of um, where I'm from, my schooling. I am one of you. If you're going through the engineering college, uh, BTEC CSIT with Diana Kivan, took the buses just like you do today, uh, rode my bike, bike, bicycle to the bus stop to get to the bus. Uh, so very similar to one of you. Um, I did my master's in US in computer science, uh, advanced computer networking and uh, native XML databases. So native XML databases, uh, you know, these were the early days of uh, XML documents being stored into a database in native state um, and JSON vice versa. And you can imagine the time frame being around 2003, 2004, quite a few years ago. I have uh, the, the relevant certifications for the session today. I have a artificial intelligence implications for business strategy the certificate from uh, MIT. For those of you who, who are familiar with, it's, uh, it's one of the um, well-known reputable organizations, educational institutions. The second one is uh, uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. It's a well-known uh, institution with respect to uh, medicine, medical sciences in general. Healthcare, if you want to put the bigger umbrella, I'm a certified clinical informaticist from University of Wisconsin Madison. So, in a nutshell, I'm a, a computer architect, programmer, software engineer, geek, you you name it, that knows a um, little bit about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. I'm just saying a little bit because there's a lot that I don't know. And then um, I'm certified to be able to communicate with physicians, doctors in general, um, all over the world uh, with the necessary tools and, and know-how and knowledge uh, needed to be able to communicate with physicians effectively. I speak their language. Then uh, as far as my career goes, I spent a, few, a little bit of time early on in my career in uh, security realm of a Japanese company, I worked for their uh, security side. Um, after that, health insurance, which included commercial insurance, um, government-provided insurance, individual um, insurance, which is 
private parties going ahead and buying the insurance from the insurance, health insurance company. Pharmacy uh, worked in transportation logistics. And automotive finance, I, used, I worked for um, Volkswagen, Audi, Porsche, Bentley, Bugatti, uh, Ducati, the motorcycle dairy financial division here in uh, North America as a enterprise architect. I would say my enterprise architecture journey uh, started during my late days at Humana, which is the health insurance company here. And then uh, really, I learned a lot during my transportation logistics time and automotive finance. And then I uh, started applying that during my automotive finance time and into the healthcare hospitals. Currently, I'm at NetApp, as I was alluding to at the beginning. Hobbies, as you may have read through already, uh, it's probably the one title that you can correlate to very easily. Um, read through that, please. And reach out to me if you have any questions or queries. Or if your if your interest lies in playing one of those racket sports, I'll I'll be sure to keep you updated when I come to India next time to the campus, and uh, maybe we could, uh, you know, play tennis or racquetball or or whatever is available around. All right, so going to the next slide here. <clears throat> now, let let's do something. This is an interesting exercise. I'm gonna uh, walk you through a, a an imagination of sorts. So imagine you are um, at the verge of starting your own enterprise. Well, before I say the enterprise word, nobody starts an enterprise really. What they start with is they identify a problem that is worth solving and they'll implement a solution for it. So let's just say today the hot topic, COVID. And one of you is so motivated that they want to find the machine learning based or AI based model that predicts that a person is more prone to COVID than another person. And let's just call it COVID predictor. I wonder if you implemented that. Let's say we went ahead and, and started a new business unit for it, uh, which, which had, uh, you know, maybe you're the only developer. Maybe you have a friend who's helping you do the development. And then you started, you have to have accounting if you're going to start a new business, right? You have to be able to um, send those invoices, uh, um, collect payments, issue bills, um, then send receipts back when you, and then uh, process the payments. Um, so there's a bunch of accounting work. So in, in a nutshell, accounting you can imagine as uh, finance. Uh, if you're um, getting fin your organization finance from a bank, and then you'll have your accounts payables and accounts receivables. Accounts payables are the bills that you have to pay as an organization. And accounts receivables are the, is the money that others would need to pay to you. You also need to have some set of marketing. Uh, I heard somebody on the line. If you are intending to ask a question, please raise your hand. If you're not, uh, please keep yourself on mute. All right, so um, you have to have a marketing wing so that the the people around the world would get to know that you have a COVID prediction model. And then sales, obviously you have to have sales that can reach out to people, um, have those leads and sell the, sell the product to them. Let's say that we did this successfully. We sold this to a few hospitals in the Southern side of India. Then year one was good. We made some profits. Let's assume that this product is based out of you know, one of the popular cloud providers, let's just say AWS. And we're able to scale, no problem. Um, it's elastic, storage elastic, compute elastic. And your memory elastic, no problem. Then three years passed, three years of profits. Great, organizations grew now. You have a development team of 10. Accounting team of four, marketing and sales, usually a little bigger than the rest of the organization, maybe 20. And you realize that you're not as agile uh, to change, you're not as quick to change as you used to be being a startup. Um, then you start realizing or feeling, wait a minute, why are we not growing and why are we not able to implement uh, you know, models at the same pace as we did the first model? because of the size, you're a much larger organization now. 
decisions are by committee. They are no longer uh, taken by experts. Are 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 a you know if you there is a rule that says if you cannot share um, a pizza, one pizza, medium sized pizza with your team, and you, if your team you know needs more than one pizza pie, then your team is too big for to be agile. And there is another side of the same story that says, well, wait a minute, product teams might be a little bigger depending on the product. That's true too. However, if you're applying microservices-based design, or if you set set your uh, footing on the right right direction by starting with uh, domain-driven design, these are terms that I'm using to just to give you an uh, idea on what are the different ways that you can start an organization to be better. So if you start your organization uh, by using domain-driven design principles, and if you've implemented microservices, then you will not have the hiccups that a organization that would start without those two will have. So keep this in mind. You have an amazing model. You deployed that as a service in AWS. You have a JSON service that if you send, send a bunch of patient information, the JSON service replies back with a score and tells the caller exactly whether that particular patient, um, how prone that patient is or the person is to get COVID. It's wonderful, it works. However, if you've not kept the domain driven uh, design principles in mind when designing, and if you've not implemented your product as a microservice, you will have issues, you will have trouble. Most startups will not do domain driven design because that's not the key motive behind them and that's not what they're thinking. Some of them might, some of them might. But I want uh, this class that is listening to me today, I want this class to be one of them who keep the domain driven design in their mind and does their product development using the principles of domain driven design using leveraging microservices. In future, if time permits, uh, not, not in the next month or so, um, we could have another session on domain driven design. In the meantime, I'll give you some resources to, to read through. I have some articles published out there. And uh, I'll share that with you and you'll get to read them. Now, what, so, so going back to this fictitious, fictitious made up, not real organization that has a COVID model, this model has grown to the point, or this organization has grown to the point where you as the CEO, right, are no longer happy with the, with the scalability of this organization, or you're no longer happy with the agility that, with which you can implement changes to the organization. What's going on? How do we how do we fix this? So today, if you look at the look at the majority of the bigger organizations, um, including the big boys, the Googles, the Microsoft, at some point these organizations are, are, are Amazon for that matter. Why why leave out Amazon? Come on. So if you look at them, at some point they were organically growing really in Ali. And eventually they realized, wait a minute, we cannot be like this. We need to grow in such a way that we're manageable, where we can scale easily, we're agile. All right, so they realized we need to have some sort of a framework that helps us to adapt to change. Change is inevitable, but their change comes uh, because of uh, a set of people leaving, set of people coming into the organization, or a change comes whether we're sunsetting a technology are bringing in a new technology. The change could be we're sunsetting a process. That process is no longer applicable and we're implementing a new process. There are three different terms that are used there. People, technology, and process, business process. Not the computer processor process uh, kernel. I'm not referring to that. Process, this is more a businessy term, process. So people, technology, process is what constitutes an organization in general. So if you want agility with respect to these three attributes, you have to have a framework that you can use or that you can ha have as a foundation to implement your change. All right. And let's see. I have a small video prepared for you. Please reduce the volumes on your headphones. Um, this is uh, not very, sh I didn't prepare this by the way, I, I liked it. I, I liked the perspective it presents the information in. I wanna give you a, a heads up though. There are several different perspectives to look at an organization and say, wait a minute, this organization has become too complex. This is one of the perspectives. This is one of the data perspectives. 
uh, as a CEO, as the organization, organization is running, uh, I bet in the morning you're going to call your uh, analytics team and say, hey, keep, make sure you send these reports to me every single morning. I need to know what happened yesterday, those descriptive reports, and I need to know what your predictions are for today. Those predictive reports, if you remember my analytics pyramid from our last session, and then they would say, okay, so if, if, the, if the stock market's going to do this, what should I do? So you're going to ask for those prescriptive reports. So you're going to ask for descriptive reports, predictive reports, and prescriptive reports. Uh, so this is from a reporting perspective, which is usually one of the first things that a CEO would look at and go, wait a minute, what is going on in my organization? I'm going to start playing the video. Please make sure you have your headphones on and make sure the volume is not too much. Here we go. Why enterprise architecture? Well, here's a reason. Michael works at our company. Now, because of new business demands, he is in need of specific data. But his data is spread out over different applications. Exclusively for Michael, a developer writes a program that will get his data from applications A, B, and C and write it to an Excel file in directory Y. That way, Michael will be able to read all the data in his spreadsheet and use it. Michael then realizes that he needs this on a daily basis. It would save a lot of time if the program ran automatically every day. Therefore, an infrastructure manager writes a batch job to set this up for him. Now, uh, excuse me, sir. Created, especially for Michael, which depends on a number of other applications. But Michael is not the only one who wants to improve his efficiency. So multiply this situation by a few thousand. We call this hairball architecture. Think of it as a huge hairball with fibers going in every possible direction. No one's keeping track of it, and no one has control over it. Now, imagine we have to replace a huge application because it's out of date, and the supplier has said that in two years they'll stop the support. We have no idea what the application is connected to. It's an endless network of dependencies, which were all created one at a time. And each connection made sense at the time, but the total is such a chaotic situation that it's impossible to change one aspect without damaging something else. Now that's where enterprise architecture comes in. We have to deal with the IT landscape in such a way that people have the freedom to create improvements and that there's always room for innovation. Architecture makes sure that our IT landscape is robust as well as flexible and efficient. This requires a process to keep things organized. For this reason, each new project needs a project start architecture. This is created by a project architect who is part of the project team. He or she writes a plan explaining how the total landscape will look when the project is complete. This plan includes the applications we've set up, what they do for the business and the hardware they require. The project start architecture is evaluated by the architecture board. In this board, Architects from every domain in our company work together and supervise the entire landscape. Summarized, enterprise architecture is about three things. We take a look at the existing situation. We help to develop and evaluate designs. And we create a sketch for the future so that everyone understands the direction we're heading. Architecture is about insight and knowledge. The world doesn't lend itself to being easily understood or pinned down in rules. There's no way we can know what the regulators are going to say to us three years from now. But what we can do is make choices which will ensure that we will be flexible, robust and efficient in the future. Because in the end, it's all about maintaining our ability to change. That's why enterprise architecture All right, the, the individual who I put this together, uh, he, he did an amazing job. Um, let's see, it looks like uh, there is a question. Rupesh, uh, go ahead. Good evening, sir. Yes, Rupesh, go ahead, please. 
So uh, I have a doubt regarding the JS Wayne's JavaScript object notation. And so well, while I'm what, what is the I'm sorry, what is this regards to? What's the question it's about? A JS Wayne's sir. JS JSON. Wayne. Okay, okay, JSON. Go ahead. So when I'm been practicing some of these services in the AWS, that is Amazon Web Services, sir. So that is IAM, sir, Identity and Access Management. Mm -hmm. So in that, uh, so I have been used to this JS Wayne in uh, um, so, so, so like that as when I've been creating a user, sir. So after some multi-factor authentication, so I'm been giving an access sir, to the user, such as uh, if, we, if for example, we, if we take the star means, so the, all the access permissions are being given to the users. And so um, as a, uh, for example, so me, Rupesh, um, who is just a student of the series, Dan Ketan. And so for only for the practicing purpose, uh, so I am been using this Amazon Web Services, sir. So if uh, when I am when I have to uh, develop a company and and then I want to give the training to my employees, so to do the requirements uh, given by the clients on the Amazon Web Services. So mm -hmm. uh, how can uh, so uh, so due to the start so do only this is in startup, so uh, only I am the admin, sir. So uh, how can I get access to that uh, AWS uh, and creating the roles for users on the IAM by using IAM, sir? Mm. Um, <clears throat> I like the enthusiasm, Rupesh. It's a little out of context to answer, but I'll try my best, all right? Yes. Uh, let me time box two minutes, just, uh, just so everybody else is not completely lost. When it comes to securables, you're, you're building some assets on AWS. Uh, and apparently the assets have APIs and you chose JSON to be uh, the way that the the, uh, the external callers call your asset or your product, whatever that is. Um, now, when it comes to securables, uh, when you're trying to secure us, there are certain principles of enterprise architecture that you should be using. There are application securables and there are business securables, right? Uh, application securables are the securables that you're referring to where a JSON service or an API is calling a database within the ADBS and there is security related to who can call or who can make connections to the database. That is application securables. Business securables is uh, as a product, this JSON probably performs something. Let's check the example of a COVID model. And the COVID model is consumed or called by, let's say, the Swims Hospital in Tirupati. As you know, we have a fictitious COVID model, right? Let's continue. The Sims Hospital will call the JSON service to identify whether a person has COVID or not. Uh, th that particular, the, the security or the principles that you apply to your web service or a JSON service, in other words, are business securables. Um, when it comes to business securables, um, assuming you're using OAuth, assuming you're using third party uh, auth providers like Google or, or uh, any, any organization that does one ID. Unfortunately, today, even Facebook can do one ID, which is, which is a completely different conversation. But, but let's just say you, you decide to use one ID from Google. Then what you would have to do is, uh, uh, the, I was referring to domain driven design. You'll have to come up with different domains for your product. And for each domain, you have to identify which are, what are business securables. Once you identify your business securables, then you have to come up with, for each of the business securable, um, you have to come up with a umbrella um, IM group, a security group that users who have access to that service for the, to that product, to that domain fall into. And you have to have a domain admin. Typically, the domain admin for SWIMS will be somebody at SWIMS, it will not be you, it will not be your professor or anybody from your organization, it will be somebody from SWIMS. Then they will manage the end user's access and, and user um, lifecycle management, deleting users, adding users and such. If it's a JSON service, more than likely, uh, well, let me, let me take a step back. If it's a JSON service and if you're not worried about capturing the end user's identity via impersonation all the way to your database level, then you're at the JSON service. In which case, um, that users, those users are definitely maintained by SIMS. However, if you have the need to know which, um, I'm gonna use relational databases here just for, to make it easier for you to understand, which table and column was changed by who, then you'll have to have the business securable or that particular user's 
identity impersonated all the way to the database. So things get a little complex in that case. But either way, um, the principles that you have to remember are domain-driven design and then identify which are application securables and business securables. All the cloud providers, um, Amazon, Azure, and Google, all of them have standards-based OAuth um, implementation. So all of them will support this, the concepts of enterprise architecture that I was just uh, sharing. We do have a security domain in the session, uh, which is, let me see where that is at. Security domain is last but one right here. We'll see how far we can get to the session when we're covering security architecture. Uh, I'll be sure to touch base on that a little bit. But uh, just not to lose the audience too much, Rupesh, that's all the information I can share at this point. Does that help? Rupesh, if you're speaking, you're probably on mute. All right, Rupesh, if you're uh, uh, not happy with the answer, um, come back and raise your hand uh, during the security uh, uh, module of this session and we'll cover that at that point. Okay, uh, since we're paused and taking a break here, anybody have any other questions, similar questions or questions that are not similar, no issues, any questions? All right. Well, um, you have to have a definition, right, for enterprise architecture. Without the definition, um, you, you, you have to have a definition. So th this is somebody's definition. Um, I happen to like the, um, the, the integrity of this and also happen to like the, how complete it is. And you, as you can see, here's the link to where I found the definition. So read, read that at your own will and wish. But what I want you to take away from this is that um, enterprise architecture is about being able to understand people, process, and technology that's happening in an organization. Let's see. Let's get to the uh, article here. I want to see if there's anything that's worth covering for us. Yeah, do, do click on the article, go to the enterprise architect role. What is the role? What is the salary like? Uh, what are the different tools that you need to know to become an enterprise architect? So definitely look at this article. It's in the PowerPoint in the slide. So please look at the article. If you're thinking about, you know, I want to be that guy. Uh, I want to be sure I want to be one of them. What do you need? So these are the things that you need. Just a very high little broad stroke, but even then, uh, that gives a good starting point. I get a lot of time, I get questions uh, from family and friends. How do I become an architect, right? And then how do I become an enterprise architect? You know, how do I become a CEO or a CTO of an organization? Well, it's a journey and you start adding these leaves or feathers of capabilities to your portfolio or your, your expertise. Then you start learning things and you start adding more things and eventually people will start calling you an architect after a certain period of time. That's what happened to me. I never called myself an architect. I even today, I call myself a, a still a, uh, an engineer of sorts. And people will call me different names depending upon who they are and what they're expecting from me. All right. Um, let's see. Well, when what are the benefits of having an enterprise architecture? Again, this is a set of benefits provided by uh, uh, CAPTIA happened to be one of the reputable organizations. And um, what, what it helps, enterprise architecture helps having the framework in place, actually helps better collaboration between IT and your business units. Uh, there's a popular term in the uh, enterprise world in, the, uh, in general organizations, it's called joint application development. So applications are envisioned by a set of people from very diversified backgrounds. Some of them might have a marketing major, some of them might have a sales major, a major meaning they might have a degree in the marketing, they might have a, a degree in sales. Uh, some of them might have a degree in design, product design, uh, on, and some of them might come in, they might, they might have a degree in art, and some of them might have a degree in like you and I, computer science. So so diversified set of people get together and participate in what is called a JAD session, joint application development sessions, to either create the uh, application, design it initially, or uh, make changes to it or make suggestions on what should be changed. 
this becomes very easy with enterprise architecture. Typically, uh, these sessions have um, an architecture or an architect present, or at least architect driving the conversation. And we'll get into those uh, nuances uh, in uh, tomorrow's session. Next, uh, enterprise architecture uh, provides the business the ability to prioritize investments. Um, you know, with the today's, uh, what's happening in the current state of affairs, not just with COVID, but in general, in very dynamic markets, um, budgets are very fluid. They, they might start at the beginning of the year by putting um, a certain amount of money on a particular product and say, we need to make this product better because there is a market for this product. Half it through the year, they might realize, oopsies, this is not good. Uh, we need to change that from that product to this second product. They might decide, you know what, we manufacture tires for cars and trucks, but unfortunately with COVID, nobody's buying tires. There's not a whole lot of people driving, but we do manufacture on this other side, we manufacture uh, specialized equipment for hospitals. Maybe that's the business that we should invest in manufacture more. So when they decide to prior you know, prioritize investments in one, from one to the other, having an enterprise architecture helps them understand the impact of unplugging that investment from tire manufacturing and sending those funds into this hospital manufacture, hospital equipment manufacturing. And then, um, well, the, the, the third bullet point is similar to if you wanted to understand what the long-term impacts of um, uh, implementing a particular initiative to people, process, technology in the organization, you, know, you have to have an enterprise architecture in place. What are the different parts of enterprise architecture is coming up? We'll go through that in a second or in a few minutes. Then uh, enterprise architecture also helps um, implement processes to evaluate and procure technology. Let's say that you implemented your COVID model, life is great, you're going through and you're making, you know, your business is good. Uh, let's assume that your COVID model is implemented using Python and the Python package that you're using. Um, you learn today that next week, that Python package is no longer be available um, and or, or it's uh, deprecated, meaning it's not as accurate as it used to be. And now there is an R package that came out that is super duper good and it actually predicts the onset of COVID in a person much more accurately and probably runs faster too. Just to give it a few attributes that are appealing to you and you wanna procure that particular technology. Then enterprise architecture helps you understand the impacts there with technology change. The JSON wouldn't change to Sims Hospital. That's the key thing to remember. The JSON structure would stay the same. The processes behind the scenes in this case, the R-based model or the Python-based model is being replaced with an R-based model. Both will run in AWS just fine. Um, and then the next thing, uh, next thing is that um, uh, typically, um, when within an organization, architecture team could be an enigma without the enterprise architecture team. If there is no enterprise architecture team, the business units will constantly be questioning you know, what does this architecture team do? They don't, they're not, they're not doing anything. So if you have the enterprise architecture in place, then those business units will start to use the enterprise architecture as the eyes and ears uh, to see what's happening in their organization when they, when they come up with changes or when they think about implementing a particular initiative into the organization. Um, I heard somebody was speaking, any questions? I don't see any hands raised. If you don't have a question, please uh, keep yourself on mute. Uh, sir, this is Harpreet, sir. Yes, go ahead, Hari, please. Uh, sir, you can uh, mute the students that uh, uh, disable the option that the students can unmute themselves, sir. Why? Because uh, uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately, if some of their hands may touch the unmute. Oh, button, okay. Like, yeah, okay. This. Yeah, I, I, I like, I like uh, uh, autonomous smart students than me coming down and saying I'm going to mute them. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, 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 see it, I see what you're going. There's a, there's a lot of students in here. That I, don't, I don't know if it's practical for me to skim through all of them, but, but okay, so I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Mute all option. If you click okay. that, uh, there will be some allo, uh, likewise, uh, we can. Uh... Oh. Alrighty. I may have accidentally muted everybody, including Hari Sarathar. Sorry about that. Sorry, I clicked on the mute all. All right, I, I got your point. Makes sense. Thank you. I did that now. Uh, all right, let's continue. 
Um, let's see. Now, the last bullet point is very interesting. Let's say that uh, SU University, right? There is a Rupesh there, there is a Harizar there, there is an Arinder professor there, and they are very smart people too, right? They're, they're studying just like you are, and they came up with the COVID model. All of a sudden, um, assumes is evaluating their COVID model, thinking, oh, this is probably cheaper, maybe, maybe they might perform better. Or, or just let's take a look at what uh, SU University's engineering college code model looks like. Or maybe IIT Tirupati, I don't know where they're at, what their capabilities are. Let's give, let's give them the benefit of doubt. Let's say there's students at IIT Tirupati and they are trying to, they're implementing a model. Um, your enterprise architecture framework would help you present your case in such a way that where you're actually drawing out the strengths uh, within your um, product design. Two swims. Uh, this could be scalability reasons. It could be the fact that your your product is implemented in multiple zones. It's more resilient. Uh, there isn't probably no downtimes. Uh, maybe uh, because of the fact that you're an education institution, you're getting special discount and you move to Azure. So you are able to offer your product at a lower price. So all of these aspects of uh, a product in general, um, all of the different perspectives um, will come into fruition when you have an enterprise architecture team or an enterprise architect helping you see those different perspectives. And you can present your case much more strongly to your clients saying these are the different aspects of our organization. So you can compare, all right, compare is the keyword. You can compare your enterprise, act using your enterprise architecture framework, you can actually compare your product with others and present the case to your clients much more effectively. At that point, it's no longer a vaporware. Uh, and a product you know, smoke and mirrors, it's actually the, the real deal. All right, I put some very nice um, links in here for you to go through. And um, let's see if I can open one of them. See, this, is, uh, this is a favorite view of mine. It's very busy, my apologies, but we'll stay at the top. The four uh, columns, not the first one, um, business architecture, data architecture, application architecture, and technology architecture. Let's just stay there for the second, for this session, we're probably gonna cover those four. I'll keep this um, um, a diagram up on the side and I'll, pull, I'll be pulling it in the next uh, few minutes, maybe a couple of times. So the next, in the next remaining part of the session, I'll pull that in once or twice to show you those uh, intricate details of each of those columns. All right, going on to the next one. Data architecture. Uh, there are um, open uh, bodies, like for example, the open group or the TOGAF, they all have different standards about, well, I use the term standards. Well, we'll, we'll get to that in, in the next session. But the thing is, everybody's got their own opinions about what an enterprise architecture should be, right? I got an opinion. Uh, I'm sure you have an opinion by now already. And, and there have been many uh, opinions like this in the years past. Uh, what what these consortiums have done is that they've got uh, some of the brightest minds in the in the industry get together, like the Apples, uh, AWS. By the way, when you use Apples and AWS, don't be don't be thinking, oh, this big organization. No, it's just one of you working there, right? It's just uh, smart people like yourself working at Apple, smart people like yourself working at AWS. They just set a group a group of people get together and say, hey, we did the enterprise architecture like this, we did the enterprise architecture like that. Uh, let's I think let's take the commonalities or the strengths or best best things about each of these and put together a framework as a reference to others to use so that um, your little COVID model organization uh, wouldn't need to go through all the troubles and turbulences of implementing a, a robust enterprise architecture from scratch. You could just take the benefits that uh, uh, that are published on TOGAF or open the open group and just use them because they've been uh, they've been painstakingly people burnt their fingers, but fallen down, scraped their knees, and eventually realized this is a decent framework for you to use. A data architecture deals with how data is um, laid out in the organization. How is the data designed? You could have structured data, unstructured data, semi-structured data. Let's stick to structured data for a couple of minutes. If you have structured data, then you have um, your data laid out in relational databases relational databases. Um, you have your OLTP databases that are doing your OLTP transactions, which would have tables and columns. 
uh, namespaces and such, depending upon which flavor of what or schemas, depending on what what kind of database you chose. Um, and on top of that, you have your um, OLAP databases, which are used typically. They're flat in nature. They have dimensions. They're facts. The, the somewhere in between you have a star schema. But by the way, these are terms that you would get to know during your database design uh, class. I don't want to get into them too deep, but what I want to, what I want, the point I'm trying to drive is that there are different ways of looking at data in an organization. Uh, one of the ways is uh, a data flow. How is the data flowing within the organization? Right, that's one view, data flow diagram, which is a very popular diagram that's used in an organization to explain how data is flowing. The second is, uh, uh, an entity view. What are the different entities in the organization? How are they related? Uh, popularly known as entity relationship diagram, right? So data flow diagram and um, entity relationship diagram are very popular. Well, let's get into one of these links and I'll show you. Uh, there are other types of diagrams in, in the world in general, right? Uh, let's see, this is a, a, a diagram, actually class diagram. Um, let's see, so these are different uh, diagrams that you could use to represent how your data is flowing or how is your data is morphing or changing as you implement business processes. All right. And then, um, let's see, I'm gonna close this. Please click on that, read through, no issues. Uh, the data flow diagram and the interrelationship diagram are more close to your hearts and where you're coming from. And you, they're actually one of the, two of the most popular ones in the enterprises in general. So think of it like this, you're implementing a product and there's a set of people that, that, that would be impacted because of your product, right? There is a database uh, administrator who's gonna help you maintain your databases and he or she needs to understand how your product works. How is the data flowing? What ports need to be kept closed and open? Um, how would uh, he or she need to implement security on them? So they need to understand your product a little bit. So whatever they need to understand are the views that I was referring to data flow diagram right, and relationship diagrams. And there are non-functional requirements for the database, for example, what is the database growth going to look like from year one, year two, year three, year five, five years from now? Uh, what is your, uh, how, how should we back up your database? Do you have an application backup uh, scripts that they need to run or should they use, let's take an example of a Microsoft SQL Server. Should they use SQL Server backup and restore scripts that come standard with the database? Uh, the other aspects are, for example, how highly available should this database be, right? Should it be available uh, five nines, like 99.999% of the times, right? The other aspect is um, after the highly available, um, you have to think about how performance should the database be? Should, do you need an in-memory database that, that, that is super snappy and super fast in OLTP transactions? Right, there are non-functional requirements. We'll get into non-functional requirements in the tomorrow session. So those are the aspects and views that data architecture would provide to the organization. Next one is application architecture. So this is where um, somebody like Rupesh, the design that he was referring to a few minutes ago, he would draw out and say, oh, I have this endpoint published in WWW. That no, endpoint... My college is in the okay. Um, all right. So you have an endpoint published in www that's called by swims. Let's say the URL that's called by swims would say, uh, you know, Rupesh LLC. Right. Let's see. Uh, Pujita. Um, R. Shushmita, please. Uh, Kindly mute yourself. Uh, I've been trying to mute and somehow it's uh, unmuting. Um, sir, help us out. You just make me host at once, sir. I'll just. All right, uh, Hari Prasad, let me find you. Sorry, I think I was clicking mute and oh. I may have muted uh, you. Right? Yeah. So just make me host at once. All right, let me see, participants. I raised my hand, sir. Oh, okay. I see, yeah. 
<clears throat> yep, you're you're the host now. Then it's yeah. All right. Uh, sir, now I have unmuted you as well as making you host back, sir. So now okay. you can continue. Yeah, I, I think you can still be the host. I'm okay. Uh, I think my presentation is still on, so I don't have to be the host. So you could be the host. Thank you. Sure, sir. Thank All you. right. Application architecture. So let's say that Sims is calling a COVID model. Uh, it's a JSON endpoint that's uh, published on AWS. It's got a URL. So it's got Rupesh Asam's company, uh, dot com or dot in uh, forward slash COVID model, then, you know, the first thing that should happen is uh, something should DNS resolve Rupesh Awesome's uh, company dot in to whatever the IP that endpoint is. So there's aspects of that request when it's made by Sims. And by the way, even before that request makes to the service, there is aspects of security, right? They need to be, uh, they need to do a TLS handshake to, so that the, the communication is transport secure, right? Something would need to do message level decryption so that the message that's sent encrypted is decrypted for the service to consume. So there's aspects of the application itself that would need to be documented in such a way that if Rupesh becomes a CEO and he doesn't want to do the development anymore, and if he hires uh, Rakesh, for example, then Rakesh would need to maintain this. He needs to understand. So the rest of the organization would need to understand um, what uh, Rupesh cooked up and how this application or the product works. So that's the application architecture diagrams. Typically, your application architecture diagrams would include uh, system views, um, application architecture views, sequence diagrams, right? and um, uh, and uh, one of the most more popular uh, uh, types of diagrams is a uh, UML diagram. This is more popular. Tograph actually recommends using UMLs. Now, all the way at the bottom here is a sequence diagram. Um, it's a free web sequence diagram. It's free for anybody to use. You can just go there, start drawing sequence diagrams. It's free. It's a web application. Um, the the and uh, you would enjoy doing that. So you just have to get used to it a little bit, but it's free to use and you can use it. If you're familiar with the Visio, the Microsoft Visio, uh, continue to use that. It's an awesome tool, but for sequence diagrams, I feel that the web sequence diagrams is faster. I can be sitting with a, uh, a business owner, a business unit owner on the business side, and as they explain the problem, I could draw away my design in sequence diagram within, within seconds, within minutes, and how that should be solved. All right, next one is uh, technology infrastructure architecture. So this deals with your infrastructure. The people who are managing or are keeping an eye on up to date, updating your, your infrastructure. You could be on AWS cloud on premise. Um, and these people would need an architecture viewpoint on what the product is, how the product is designed. So they're looking for diagrams like a server topology diagram, a network topology diagram, Right. They might also ask you for um, a security topology diagram. Security topology draws security boundaries so that they, they would know uh, which server should be deployed where. Can I deploy this server public facing? Can I deploy this server in the DMZ, demilitarized zone? I used a term that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, We'll try to we'll we'll try to cover or maybe I'll put an external reference to the DMZ or you could just Google for DMZ. Uh, it has nothing to do with geopolitical wars that happen between between nations headed by bad people. I'm referring to a network uh, technology term DMZ. All right, so the certain data certain servers like for example database servers should be kept internal. They shouldn't be public. They shouldn't be in the DMZ. They should be internal in their own private subnet secure. So. Uh, you have to create certain views to help your infrastructure team do your, their job best so that they understand the product um, well enough to do their, to perform their functions. There are a couple of um, links in here. Please go there and do read through them. This is for your reference. Uh, the next one is uh, business architecture. Business architecture helps um, enterprise architect in general to create views of the organization about what does the organization do in general? What are the capabilities of the organization, right? Um, and 
uh, the the other the other aspects of business architecture are, for example, how is the organization organized? What is the org structure? Okay, uh, these are the two popular views: the capability model. The first one, what is what does the organization do? Is a capability model. The second one is how is the how is the organization organized? That's an organizational mapping model. And there is other mapping models, um, for example. Um, initiative mapping, objective mapping, uh, uh, quite a lot of those, which we'll cover. There is actually a, a session coming up for us, uh, which is next week, not the tomorrow session, but the next week session where we'll get into those things a little bit, which is very important. By the way, students note this, uh, the pieces of information that I'm sharing with you are things that you cannot Google for to get in their entirety. The context is not there. You'll have bits and pieces but the overall context is what you'll be gaining as you gain experience as you work in an organization. So I'm trying to give you heads up into things that nobody will teach you. These are things that you will teach yourself. I'm trying to give you heads up or a head start, I should say. When you get ready for interviews and such, these will help you uh, put your candidature better. All right, let's see. Uh, so each of the, if you think about an organization and capabilities, what the organization can do, and if you stitch those capabilities one after the other, then what you, you will have is what is called a value stream. A value stream is a, a revenue generating stream. So if you think about uh, your COVID model, at the end of those calls and once the hospital makes their calls, um, each call, let's say your licensing model to SWIMS is, is call-based and you'd say, okay, SWIMS, uh, you have two licensing models to choose. First licensing model, uh, we're going to charge you uh, 500 rupees for each call that you make. That's one kind of licensing model. It's it's paper call, paper transaction. The other licensing model is you might cap them and say for one million or well one crore um, calls a year, um, you have to pay this much amount of money and you can get one crore calls a year. If you go over, then each transaction is 500 rupees. Right now, when each transaction costs or licensing costs pay you 500 rupees, you have to look back and say, All right, so each call is going to be 500. Uh, I have to think about how much did the security cost within the call, right? There is a security overhead, ADBS uh, licensing costs if it's deployed on ADBS. And then you also have certificates that you have to maintain and manage, right? All the endpoint will have certificates. You have to pay certificate authorities some money to give you certificates. So there's costs involved in each and every step of that call being successful back to SWIMS. So that 500 rupees, each call, will be paying for every single thing that it touches. Security, your database, your EC2 containers, your block storage, your auditing capabilities, your reporting capabilities, uh, your admin uh, yearly license fees are, are your fees that ABS collects. So everything is in that in that 500 rupees bucket. So value streams are um, are very helpful. Our value stream views, which is part of the enterprise architecture or, or business architecture, help you understand how money is generated in your organization. What are the different value streams you have, and where how what is the cost of each stage? Uh, for example, here, uh, patient care events, this is an example, by the way, loosely put example, is a value stage. A value stage could be a business process in itself, or it could be a small capability um, in itself. So they help you understand how the revenue is generated and what are the different revenue generating streams in the organization. Um, we have four minutes left, and I think uh, I would say that's a good stop for the day. We'll pick it up tomorrow. Any questions, students? And there are some references at the bottom for business art. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. I'll be here for the next couple of minutes. Go ahead, Rupesh. Looks like you have a question. Sir, am I audible to you, sir? Yes, Rupesh, go ahead. Sir, when if I take in a real time scenario, sir, so that I have been started in company and so I'm being with the help of the Amazon Web Services. 
you know, no, sir, that uh, by using the, so I have been recently doing in course sir, on uh, Amazon Web Services uh, Solutions Architect. So mm -hmm. I have been seeing in uh, something like as uh, in videos, sir, that uh, that is in creating uh, web servers, servers, mm -hmm. and not okay. creating a website by using that server without serverless websites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, serverless uh, computing. Websites. Okay. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, so what my doubt is, sir. Hello. Yep, yep. Go ahead, Rupesh. You're you're audible. I can hear uh, you. Yes, sir. Um. So can I speak in my mother tongue or uh, in English, sir? Feel, feel free, Rupesh. English, Hindi, Telugu, go for it. Chapande. Sir, if you want to know that you have free services, then you have free services. Ah, okay. Service yeah, yeah. Correct. You have to create your own, sir. But hmm. if you take as an enterprise, such as a startup, sir, so with hmm. the help of the five to ten people or just below the hundred people, and hmm. actually normally the paid gets sir. Normally Amazon Web Services and up to some limit it has, but after hmm. that it is paid gets sir. And Correct. So, on so normally the you know guess na kindo unde wale jesha just like as a database administrator and by using the IAM sir that is identity and access management. So then wale ki roles ne distan sir. And so uh, who who can create that web service? And so who and so until then okay, I'm under ni chelenge sir. And so yes. as a code mean I will use some some properties sir. And there are modules in time sir, such as Correct. a testing group, ITG and time with ITG and developers. Correct. Different end bag and so a walakin and over modules log at certain tech leads lag petty and to base in Amaga Amazon web services by the even such so in JavaScript public notation, so small data in certain format to Nenu and actually under Valaki access permission distance. Then Nakunde and Kaguna Punch Taku level low and if Nanga Amazon Valley and Napa Amazon Valley targets and a head of me. Correct, correct. And they will access the services and then access the services and then in case of paid version. Correct, you cannot. Multi-factor authentication and AD and the normal root users sometimes get, sir. IAM users. Correct, 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 correct. And they approve security and AD that button get, sir, on our Amazon services. And they approve the agents, sir, Atlanti situation. So, and the normal guys. So when you design the thing, you'll design until we design chase not put until Amazon job to know Amazon web services wildly capabilities design chase not put the world meal and to our like anti users key access if done key done it is in just around but some equal access to reduce level under for example job to know put me to car low you put a car for example on to have an economy family which not a make up either my students and going to put a an island all case law pillar on our own going to pillar when I can put you into a steering the front seat launch the driver seat launch the next it will better pillar on to run so there are some safety measures these counter wall design chase number so that you cannot accidentally damage or do something and but these are the aspects of security architecture that they have to keep in mind Yes, sir. And actually, okay. sir, uh, what's mm. my doubt is, and if not, it's a multi-factor authentication sensor. So when I've been uh, logging into the AWS account, so I'll been generating the pin in my phone. That's uh, something that that I'll been I'll been getting that uh, pin. Sir. So if I that I enter the password also, if I enter mm. that uh, pin which has been randomly generated, so I can access that website, sir. And so when I've been right. creating. Rupesh. Rupesh, I want to ask you, if you don't mind, I'll give you a few slides. I'll give you a few resources, I'll give you a few slides, I'll give you a few examples. Yes. In the next session, I'll give you a few slides. 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 Okay. Uh, actually, in my office, I have a personal office meeting, and I'm late uh, by a minute. I need to jump onto that meeting. Huh? Ah, okay. If you have an application architecture diagram, we'll, stay, we'll share with the rest of the students as well. If you have a diagram, we'll discuss it. Yes, sir. Sir, no, just like as a UML, sir. UML diagram, I use this Please diagram. Please pick, pick the easiest thing you can to express what the design is to the rest. Yes, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thanks, sir. Okay, everyone. Thank you very much. I do have to jump off abruptly here. It's uh, way past uh, 9.30. See you tomorrow. Sure, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, students, I just wanted to add a, a small point. Uh, please stay for a minute. Uh, actually, uh, software means a software job means being an IT professional. Everybody just to know that the point either developing a code and a testing. So generally, this is the only perception what you are having. 
but uh, architecture is a very important thing actually all the students so far attended i mean there is a strength of 53 students all the 53 students are really uh, very fortunate that you are about to know the basics at least the basics of architecture i mean enterprise architecture simply i want to make you clear what is enterprise architecture so software means you know that one is development developing of code and second thing is uh, testing right but there will be business requirements gathering okay better vision how to produce the product in a more qualitative way vision of the company strategies all the business requirements will be done by architects okay so what i want to simply make the thing is a software developer with more experience better expertise and the top line people will be becoming the enterprise architect i mean uh, enterprise architecture planners are a uh, enterprise architecture so that much of importance is there for architecture also the top of the line of software developers will become as uh, this architecture people so you know the structure how much importance will be there for any kind of thing any kind of entity what is the importance of structure in the similar way enterprise architecture is nothing but the business reads and the strategies to execute them so convey the same message to other friends that uh, they can also benefit for at least for tomorrow's session this is my uh, point uh, from my side okay hope you have understand and know the importance of enterprise architecture motivate uh, other friends to join for tomorrow's session students thank you so much now you can leave the session thank you <laughs>